we're speaking about an issue that is currently affecting more than 200,000 men here in Australia that we know of. Prostate cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in Australian men and nine die every single day from this largely preventable outcome. CEO of Australian Prostate Cancer Research Centre, Mark Harrison, has been leading the charge of the Australian Prostate Centre for the past almost 10 years and knows only too well the challenges in gaining support and recognition for this oftentimes preventable male-exclusive disease. The Australian Prostate Centre was established in 2012, initially as a research facility dedicated to advancing research into treatment and a cure for prostate cancer. In 2014, they opened the doors of the APC clinic and have since treated over 18,000 men without any Australian government funding, relying on a small number of dedicated philanthropic supporters and partners to drive the cause. It's undeniable that APC's work is significant and could contribute to so many more life-saving outcomes with proper support, validation, investment and recognition from our country's leaders. Mark's here with me right now to paint a much clearer picture around the myths, facts and possibilities relating to the prostate cancer here in Australia and around the world. Finally, welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks, Ray. It's great to be here uh, on a, what seems like an early spring morning in Melbourne. It's a beautiful morning to start the day. It is stunning, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Everyone gets a bit uh, sprite in their step when they see a day like this in Melbourne, as you know, coming out the back of winter. So it's great yes. to be with you. Well, um, we also have listeners um, across uh, the other side of the world in Europe who are currently sweltering, I understand. Yes, and I'm sure you're like me. Many of our friends have finally gone back to Europe for holidays post-COVID, so we're all getting these wonderful photos from the Greek islands, the ashes test, mm. from all over Europe again. So it's great to see people travelling. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we still take for granted, I think, you know, on the back of, uh, let's not say the C word on this show, yeah. but, um, yeah. you know, the, the, the absolute liberty and privilege of travelling, I think, is um, yeah. is now just... I think it feels like this is the first year that we're actually seeing people back to what we would have called normal, where they are yeah. going and catching up with family and friends and sharing their experiences. That's so wonderful. And relatively mask-free. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of these springtime vibes we're having, I didn't. I have my eyes are still intact, so I haven't started crying from all the pollen that's about. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's about Even to the, emerge. The suppers from hay fever. They're, they're in for it in the next month or so. <laughs> Now, you and I have known each other for quite a few years. Uh, we have, through the amazing work that you've done yourself for many years. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, well, part of that work and part of, you know, one of my great entrees into the world of men's health was uh, through a wonderful man who's hopefully listening in now at his daughter's uh, basketball match, Travis Strong. Now, Travis Strong was one of the founders of a great charity called White Owl for Men's Health. And uh, they were established back um, in 2015 or 2016 um, by by Travis, Scott, Stuart, Michael, Jeremy, Mark and Glenn following the loss of uh, their close friends, two close friends, one to prostate cancer and one to suicide. So Travis said to me one day, Ray, hop on a board. And I, and I did and that's when I met you. Yeah, I reckon we could easily uh, reverse this interview and I could interview you because you've got some wonderful stories to tell with the work you've done. Well, thank you very much. Let's just do that, <laughs> shall we? We can if you like. <laughs> well, I, I might take you up on that one day because it is in my bucket list. We, should, I might get, we might get Travis in here and maybe we could both interview you and do a reverse. Well, there you go. Travis, text me if you're keen to do Great. that. There's one for the future. Yeah, I, I really like that idea because, do you know, you're right, I spend so much time in in the reverse that I forget that I have collected so many stories and experiences along my own trajectory uh, that are worth telling. I think that's right, and you traverse many, uh, many different parts of society, so I think the bits you uh, come across and learn from that is very valuable. Well, thank you very much. I'm detecting here you might be the um, consummate deflector here. I might have a bit of a challenge on my my I'm hands sure, with the, I'm for, sure the, for the I'm rest sure of the your show. Skills will get the questions out that you want. Yeah. Well, you know, just going back to why Al, you know, we we were very very beautifully partnered with um, APC 
and I love the impact around the the money. I, I believe we raised almost um, a million dollars. Yeah, yeah, correct. And I think the our first entree to Trev and the group and yourself, as you mentioned, was in the very early days, and the sad passing um, of, of of the boys. And I think for me, that's a great example. We often forget or don't. Uh, see the benefit of philanthropy in this country i think we talk a lot about people that have wealth and don't give it but it's amazing uh, i think i get to see it a lot the philanthropy that happens in this country is more extensive than anybody would really know and not that people looking for thank yous around those but uh, the white owl foundation i think was a, a great example of you know some people through the tragic loss of their mates um, and the impact that had on their families and friends but coming together around a cause to, to try to make some positives out of that so Certainly what was then uh, at the Australian Prostate Centre, uh, through the White Owl Foundations, we've been able to fund uh, large portions of some of our research and also our gym, which is vitally important for the men, um, which we can talk about a little bit later in terms of what they go through. But for us, being a non-funded uh, charity, uh, being able to partner with groups like that is hugely beneficial. So, And I think for us, it gives you a, a warm feeling, as I hope it does for all those that were involved and knowing many in the White Owl Foundation they should be very proud of what they've been able to achieve but I think for us too it gives us a real positive feeling because it's great to be around people like that so that helps mm -hmm. inspire us to do more of what we're doing as well. I remember being really impacted in such a great way. Uh, I, I have some misgivings around charities in terms of I guess community will automatically just give money to a charity, not necessarily understanding where that money goes or what impact that can make. And sometimes an action is probably more valuable mm. than, than giving money. But my first visit to APC, and you took me on that tour and showed me where the money goes and really basic stuff that preserves dignity and pride of men as they go through the journey of um, diagnosis and, um, and hopefully uh, recovery. Yeah, and I think that's what we always like too is if we can show people where that money goes. And I think for us it's a little easier in the sense that we're an operating charity. So many charities you know, raise money to give money to worthy causes in their sector. Uh, for us we're raising money to put directly into helping treat and support more men and their families. So it's uh, a way that we can really show the, the benefit of, of that money coming mm. through. And, and that money I know after, well, White Owl, we wound up um, – just at the beginning of, of last year, yeah. not because we didn't want to continue, we felt that we had, had made that impact and all of us that sat on that committee had made connections where we've all gone off to continue doing the work in all different respects. So it didn't stop as in we stopped doing things, it actually gave us just a great platform uh, to, to, do, to do more. Um, and that's where Rule was born, Rule Prostate Cancer, which is the, the charity yeah. part of um, and fundraising part of of your business yeah that's right so uh, if you think of, uh, of Australian Prostate Centre it's a working centre based in North Melbourne it's a it's a clinic where we diagnose treat and support men and their families we can talk a bit more about that later but what we didn't have was a way to talk to um, I guess the retail part of fund fundraising which was us getting more into the community base so um, we did a lot of work with the people that created vitamin D and the ice bucket and the beanie challenge, um, Rod Curtis and Communal. And they really helped us create um, a sort of a go-to-market expression of what we're trying to do, which is RULE, R-U-L-E, prostate cancer. And the concept here is we know if we get prostate cancer early enough, you can rule the disease and have great outcomes. If you get it late, it's a very different story. So what we really have tried to do with RULE prostate cancer is trying to talk to 18 to 45-year-olds because they're the ones, and we talk a lot about legends in our lives. So the legend in your life could be your dad, your uncle, your grandfather, your best mate. Um, but what we do know is if the 18 to 45 year olds talk to those people, uh, i.e. the legend in their life, about getting tested, have you been tested, have you had you know, positive conversations with your local GP, uh, that can make a huge difference to them you know, living a good life uh, with their families for a, a long period of time. So that was how Rule was really born to life about mm. two years ago. So it's still yeah. in its infancy. Yeah, mm. very much so. But I, I like that messaging. And I guess the focus on that particular demographic is because that's where um, 
a lot of the diagnosis sits. Is that correct? Yeah. So if you think of um, sort of 18 to 45 year olds by the the just the raw numbers of prostate cancer, someone in that group will have seen, as I mentioned, their dad, their uncle, their grandfather that's probably got prostate cancer. So, you know, we know prostate cancer can present very early um, for men in their 40s. That's generally a very aggressive form of the disease. But it's generally not until you get into the late 40s and through the 50s where um, men will express it more uh, more prevalent. So, you know, most men will be, you know, in that we see are probably somewhere between, you know, late 40s into their, their 60s and even into their 70s now. And that's a part I don't think we should lose sight of. You know, men are living longer, which is fantastic. And, you know, we are seeing men with prostate cancer in their early 70s, but these are the men that are still, you know, they're doing a, a fun run, a bike ride, they're living a full life. So we are doing a lot more work at the, that stage of life as well to prolong men's life. Hmm. It's interesting when you talk about that demographic, my mind automatically springs to attention to say, because, you know, I'm very, very concerned about, you know, men and boys and getting right sort of um, upstream and, and, and working with boys from their infancy about showing them um, a connection through to their health and well-being rather than waiting until, say, 18, yeah. as you mentioned. And, you know, things like testicular cancer that, you know, also affect very young very young men, you know, I've heard of cases, you know, in you know early early adolescence of, of boys being affected by testicular cancer. So, you know, I'm wondering how we build, we, we show boys to build that great relationship with their bodies, especially their nether regions, um, not just to do with, um, you know, nocturnal activities, but really being very comfortable talking about um, th- th- their reproductive um, organs. Yeah, uh, I I think we're getting better. I think the younger generation, if I can call them that, uh, I think will be much more savvy about their health. I think if you take, and it's a bit general and it's always dangerous when you go general, but I think men in their sort of current 50s, they've got better, but they are still, um, you know, a bit don't talk about things. So I think the conversations we're seeing now coming from the younger generation are really positive. But, yeah, I agree, we've still got a long way to go. Well, the opportunity sits with our little kids. It does, that's absolutely. Where, yeah. That's where it can start, but I, I, I still see that we're not building proper programs and we're going to talk about policy and strategy around men's health, not only here in Australia but globally and how we really aren't investing in the early inter- intervention stuff. We think early intervention is, you know, early adulthood, whereas really um, little kids should know about you know, girls do. Yeah, that's um, right. I think the more we can teach um, boys about their health and positive health messages, uh, that can only be a good thing as they mm. grow into older adult life. Yeah. Speaking of um, birthing, um, mm. the birth of APC, Bill Guest, who, um, if you're sort of around in the in the seventies, maybe eighties, Guest's Furniture, um, Bill Guest, he's the yep. the founder and owner of yeah. that um, really mammoth. Um, furniture yeah. chain, but he was the brainchild, wasn't he? He was, yeah. So Bill uh, and his dad obviously had uh, guest furniture, which, as you mentioned, is really well known around this area. Um, Bill was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Uh, he's urologist uh, Dan Moon and Professor Tony Costello, uh, sort of eminent uh, prostate surgeons uh, globally. Bill was sort of, when he went through the journey, he was kind of amazed where it was in terms of, and he tells the story better than I can, but as he said, he, he was sort of brought up on the right side of the, the arrow and, you know, from a fairly affluent family, so he could afford the best form of treatment and care. But Bill, in his inimical way, uh, said, well, what about those that can't afford, you know, what opportunities have they got? And that's really when he kind of got together with uh, Tony Costello uh, Dan Moon and a few of uh, our uh, originating directors and said, well, maybe we can do something about this. And that's how we um, brought to life the Australian Prostate Centre. Wow. Well, that's, um, that's a lot of power in, in that in terms of, you know, leverage and um, visibility. Mm-hmm. Do you think that, you know, that sort of been achieved, what, what they've set out to achieve has met their expectations? Yeah, I'd like to think so. I think we always push ourselves and would like to think we would have done more. But if I go back to where they started, there was 
there was probably a litmus case uh, that Professor Costello had. It was a policeman from Geelong. Uh, he had um, uh, seen his GP, didn't have private health insurance, made an appointment at an uh, outpatient hospital, and he had to wait up to six months for that appointment. Now, it's not a reflection of our hospitals that do an amazing job. It's a reflection of the system and, and the funding. But he had to wait six months to be seen by a specialist in an outpatient What unit. year was this, Mark? Uh, this is going back uh, be about 10 years ago now. Okay. And at the same time, he got his appointment. Then they said, clearly you'll need more testing. Uh, so make another appointment for that. It took about three, four months. Uh, then by the time that sort of cycle went, it was 12 months. So Professor Costello, I think, says it really well, is we wouldn't let a female with a breast lump in this country you know, wait up to six months for an appointment, and rightly so, uh, and we do a great job in that space. So why would we let a male that's got the equivalent, when we call it a high PSA, which is a, from a blood test, why would we let a man with a high PSA, which is an indicator that he may have prostate cancer, uh, why would we let him wait six months? So that's how it really started. And he, you know, Why would we let that man wait six months? Well, I think, I think that's a complex answer. Which I, knew I wish I had a simple answer to it. It's probably everything we know. It's back to some of the psyche, uh, the, the general awareness, the systems, the funding, priorities. Um, I think it's probably a, a combination of all those things. But I kind of know the answer to that yeah. in my head. I would just say it's got something to do with male disposability. Yeah, but correct. That's There's a... probably a bit of that. <laughs> but that, that really was the, the, the start of it. So um, they got together. Bill had a uh, dinner at his house. Uh, Eddie Maguire emceed it um, and a lot of philanthropy around town. And this is the, the bit I love if, you, if I had to show Melbourne at its best. So we had a lot of high net worth individuals with their trusts and foundations giving seed money to start the centre. And then the unions built it uh, basically pro bono. So then what we had was probably a, a unique centre, probably in the world, uh, in North Melbourne, uh, all in one place for diagnosis, research, support and treatment. And that then gave us opportunity to start seeing men, what I would say holistically, uh, with their families, which we're really big on. Um, and lo and behold, we've seen now probably about... Well, we're seeing about 5,000 men a year and their families, um, and we see them from all points, so some from early diagnosis and some that are very late stage. So um, I think on that measure you'd say it's been a huge success. It's been, mm. been obviously a struggle in terms of financially because our premise was we want to help those that either were from new immigrant um, arrivals, so we do a lot of interpreter service work, and also those that don't have access to private health insurance. Uh, so... Uh, when you give them that form of care and treatment, it obviously comes at a cost. So that's been the the bit we've been trying to unravel for many years now. Mm. How do you think the treatment at um, at the clinic that is bulk billable, yep. thanks to the work of yep. of you guys, to, to to at least make that happen? When I say at least, not from your end, but I think you know, our government should be doing a lot more than that. How would you compare to, say, the private system in terms of outcomes? Uh, so I think the outcomes are good in private and our system. Um, private uh, is it works extremely well. You know, this country is blessed with the level of medico people that we have and, and the work they do. So I think men get good outcomes as they do at our place. I think what's probably unique at our place is, though, it's not... The care's not disjointed, it's all together. So if you think of what we've got at the centre, we've got, it's quite broad, but we've got urologist, medical oncology, radiation oncology, endocrinology, GP, uh, medical oncology and radiation oncology I did, uh, physiotherapy, psychology, dietetics, exercise physiology, physiotherapy and specialised nursing. So by bringing that together, and that was the vision of the medicos um, that got together to build this thing, was to have all of that in one place mm. because... Prostate cancer, we know, is not just one size fits all. Um, men need a combination of those forms of therapy and they need to have the best one applied at the right time in their yeah. journey. So I think for us it just means their care is um, concentrated. They come to one place outside the surgery they need. And that gives them, I think, a bit of a sense of belonging as well. So, you know, it's not uncommon, as you've seen, when you walk down the centre, um, you'll see the staff interacting with people mm. 
um, they become friends um, because many of them are with us for a long time through the mm. centre. Um, so I think that model of care is probably unique, whereas yeah. the private has all of those, but it can be quite fragmented in terms of how it's yeah. And, you know, my experience of going going there as well, I love going to the waiting room and seeing whole families there. You know, it's just you, people might imagine this very stark kind of men sort of creeping in on their own with their shame and their whatever, but it's so colourful and warm and inclusive. Yes, yeah, I think that's right. And the, the bit we love is we want it to be that way, so we didn't want to be stuck in sort of, you know, the basement of a hospital, a lot of natural light. Uh, a very warm feeling that people can feel it's their own in, the, in their sense. They can walk and go wherever they want. You know, you'll now see um, a couple of the dogs we've got that are walking down the corridors, going into the gym when the men have got the music playing. Um, and, yeah, but you see the whole microcosm of it. You see the, the sadness uh, and you see the joy. Yeah. So, um, But I hope even in the sadder times, I think uh, people still feel that they're getting the best support they can. And as you said, it's, you know, a place of belonging which is seamless. It's not disjointed where, you know, you feel warm in one spot and then have to go <laughs> somewhere yeah. cold. It's just that continuum of, of, of care. Um, on that, though, and the limitations that we've sort of alluded to around funding and resources, do you have to turn people away? Uh, you know, we don't turn them away. I, uh, what I would probably say is there's a lot more men we could treat if we had more funding. That's our biggest challenge. Um, you know, I, I think comfortably we could probably see another 5,000 men a year. Yep. But what we do know is uh, we wouldn't be sustainable in that model. So that's that's a real conundrum for us because um, I think sadly there's a lot of men still sitting out there that with some very simple interventions and or reinforcing but what they're going through is normal, that we can make a huge impact to in mm. terms of their life and then and that impacts their family life. Um, so I think, yeah, for us what we're trying to do is obviously work with governments uh, for the philanthropy of how can we get more funding to see more men. Um, yeah. And we think it's, you know, when, when the vision started, it was sort of perceived that this is something that, you know, you might have I don't know, half a dozen of these around the country or in big regional areas at a smaller degree. Mm. I think somewhere that's still a vision, um, but we're still trying to get this first one right, not in terms of what it delivers, but in terms of the funding model. Yeah, but it is a great blueprint to replicate because it works. Yeah. And, and that is undoubtedly true because you've got the data to support that. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to a break now already because we're already <laughs> half an hour into the show. Can you believe it? But I don't know if you can answer this question quickly. But what does APC do as opposed to, say, Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia or, dare I say, even Movember, who's very prominent around uh, prostate cancer? Uh, you, you put me under pressure, so I'll make it quick. Um, in a simple form, um, Prostate Cancer Foundation Australia is the, the national advocacy body for prostate cancer, so it's working with government on... Um, getting new drugs uh, approved, uh, new imaging technologies, uh, new policies, uh, working on the guidelines uh, and coordinating those uh, for testing. That's their main space and they also raise money to put into research and they do a wonderful program with the rural nurses across the country. They are funded by the government, aren't yeah, they? they? Yeah, a couple of those programs are yeah. heavily funded. So mm -hmm. um, that would be uh, PCFA. We work well with them. As I sort of mentioned earlier, we're much more probably uh, doing treatment and hands diagnosis hands-on. Yeah. But we'll uh, work with them on where we can on guidelines. Uh, where appropriate, we train and support many of their nurses where they want that work. Mm. Uh, we're also doing uh, some joint project, which is really exciting, in uh, mapping the national care pathways for prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So we're doing that with Jeff uh, Dunn and Suzanne Chambers and the team, and that's a, a really exciting project, I think. And then Movember, uh, just a phenomenal, you know, charity that now is global and has been for many years, uh, and broadening out out of prostate cancer yeah. and other men's areas, which is fantastic. What I would say they do well is they bring um, big funding to big global parts of the problem trying to solve them. So they'll fund very specific parts of research to make a big impact yeah. and or program. So. Yeah, both really good organisations. Uh, we work well with them, but we sort of cross over where we do in parts and then we all mm. plan our own space. 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it all goes together, but you, you you think about even just the power of Movember and, and the amount of money, but still we have this issue, which is so much more um, so, so 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 much more fatal than it should be, really, given all that. Yeah, I agree. I think um, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk a bit in terms of funding and where we could put it, but yeah. uh, I think there's a lot we could do with uh, you know a reasonable amount of money mm. back into the system. Yes, but for now, Mark, we come to our very first break in the show where I prepare to play our very special guest song request. Now, this is um, this is kind of a bit of a game. I like to have a bit of fun. It's just fun for me. It's not fun for, for actually anyone else. Um, but I'm going to give you a cryptic clue to help you announce the first song because you, you've told me what they are, but you actually you won't know which order. But also you have a bit of a message around how this playlist was selected and you alluded to the gym at um, APC before. Yep. So um, uh, um, men who have advanced prostate cancer, in many things we do with them, but one of the things they can go on to is hormone therapy. So then they effectively end up getting um, hot flushes, uh, muscle wasting, brittle bones. So what's really important in that space is to keep their physical exercise going. So it's quite surprising when a new man comes to our centre, they go past this gym and there's this music pumping out and there's men all in there sweating and um, having a chat. Uh, and what they're doing is uh, our uh, wonderful team, EP team, uh, Molly and Jess, are uh, working with those men to build resistance, muscle mass and strength uh, and a huge play on effect that helps in the mental health space by them being together and being uh, fit relative to where they are in their journey. So I, when you asked me for four songs, I thought probably no, none better than to ask Molly and Jess what's on the playlist in the gym. Uh, and that's how these four songs have come about. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, so the, the clue, here it goes. Now, it could have something to do with the title or the artist. Something that also kills mainly men that can be found up in the northern parts of Australia. Do you want me to say the song? Or, yep. Uh, Crocodile Rock? Correct. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Sorry, that's, a, that's the hardest part of the interview. I was feeling you're, the pressure. you're holding your yeah. heart there. <laughs> 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 because, yes, if you were wrong, you would be out. Correct. Yeah. Dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when we come back, we're going to have a little exploration around how all this started uh, for you and a bit more of a deep dive into all the how, what, why, where and whens uh, for the next 90 minutes. So, folks, you're listening to 94.1 FM. It's 3WBC. Do not go away. Oh, welcome back. The time is just 34 minutes past 10, and you're listening to 94.1 FM. It's 3WBC with Ray Bonney and Mark Harrison. He's the CEO of the Australian Prostate Cancer Centre, um, incorporating their charity arm, Rule. Um, what does it feel like being you today, Mark Harrison? Oh, it's nice. To, it feels like a privilege to be here talking to you. So, yeah, no, it's great. I think uh, I'm very fortunate with what I get to see at our centre, see the wonderful work of many people, um, both from research, treatment, diagnosis, and even the fundraising components, which are uh, equally exciting. So, yeah, I always feel a bit blessed in that. And if I'm reminded if you ever think you're having a bad day and you walk into the centre, then I, I've got no reason to think that any day is bad so yeah very lucky given that and i have had the enormous privilege of being a visitor there um from time to time can people come and visit yeah absolutely yeah just give us a call uh, at the center uh, they're more than welcome uh, anytime we we love uh, having people in and showing people around so they're welcome anytime because mm. it really is an eye opener people because it's it's not something that we want to talk about because it's you know, it means that somebody is gravely ill. However, when you see the possibility and you see, you know, prostate cancer treatment is typically met with a myth around um, being in <laughs> very uncomfortably, um, what's the word, intervened. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, there's always been, uh, we're amongst friends, it's always been that stigma about, you know, the... The, the finger and the glove test. The, um, the, the digital, the digital um, invasion, yeah. But that's become far less part of the uh, armory. I mean, it really starts with a, a simple blood test. And that, mm. you know, for most men, 
uh, hopefully they're seeing their GP on a regular visit. That should be a conversation they're having as part of um, you know, blood pressure, diabetes, uh, cholesterol, um, you know, their PSA as in their prostate should also be getting checked in that conversation. Mm. I'm going to jump around a bit now because, you know, we, we sort of ran through a bit of a program before, but sort of now we're sort of leaning into this. For men who are, you know, probably, you know, a lot of their time is taken up at work, so they have work obligations, might start very early in the morning, finish very late in the evening. Sometimes they're working also on weekends, occupied with kids' sport. What is the easiest way for a man? You mentioned hopefully a man has a relationship with a GP that he visits regularly. For those that have logistical barriers to that what would you say um i think the simplest way for him is you know seek out a, a gp um you know, i think a lot of men probably in their 40s and 50s grew up with their parents there was one gp it was a family gp we now know that you know that sort of changing a bit in terms of the movement so you may not have a gp that you've had for 40 years you say changing a bit it's completely yeah, changed correct. and it's very is very convenience store yeah. styled. Yeah, so I think they try to find somebody. I mean, it's really important, I think, uh, for those men who are 40 years of age uh, and have got a family history of breast or prostate cancer, they really should be going to their GP uh, and talking about getting tested uh, in, in their 40s. Uh, men that don't have a history in their 50s should be having that. Yeah. So if a man walked into his GP today and said, look, I listened to our Ray's show with Mark Harrison, I just want to get a PCA test now? Yeah, that's right. So they can go in, have that conversation, and then the GP will walk them through what that is. Uh, and then if they do it, it's really simple. You just get a blood test, uh, go to your local pathology. Um, they take a small amount of blood like they do for any other um, matter uh, and then you'll get a get a score on that and that score really gives you an indicator of whether further investigation is required or not. So uh, could that blood test completely miss a diagnosis of prostate cancer? Uh, pretty rare it's generally I mean again I'm probably moving to medical spaces that I'm not qualified to speak on but the PSA test is a very robust indicator of whether for the follow-ups required yeah. And then the, really the sequence is from there nowadays is uh, you'd have an MRI, which is fairly definitive uh, whether you've got it. And then off the MRI, the next step would be a biopsy uh, where they would actually take some tissue, look at it under the yeah. microscope. And uh, that would be done under general anaesthetic? Uh, they've done both. Yeah, we've yeah. started doing them as an outpatient um, yeah. at our centre. Uh, they're fairly well tolerated with most men. Um, yeah. But the majority in this country would still be done probably under a local, uh, sorry, a local anaesthetic yep. slash GA. Okay. But by the time you've gone through the blood test, then the MRI, and if it was progressing, then you would be so distressed you wouldn't really care what was... No, that's uh, right. I think then you're in the hands of your, your mm -hmm. medicos and, and, and the trust you put in them. Uh, they'll, they'll guide you uh, what the appropriate next step is yep. thereafter. Yep. Yeah. Going back to my question about logistics and barriers to um, seeking health care, by men in particular, how would you rate telehealth and the emergence of that, especially during COVID? Yeah, I could probably talk from our experience. Um, we were already doing a little bit of telehealth, uh, particularly for those men from rural uh, parts of Victoria. You know, it's nothing worse than having to see somebody come down from Mildura for you know a five ten minute appointment, literally, uh, that could be done through telehealth. So we were doing that. I think what's happened is COVID. Uh, despite the challenges we had, did have some positive things come out of it. And one of those was telehealth. So we're now doing, you know, probably 15% of probably telehealth appointments. Mm. Uh, you know, you can't do that all the time. But what we look at it now and say, well, if it's appropriate and it might be just a, a follow-up that can be done through a telehealth appointment, then we do it. So it's been pretty well tolerated. Uh, but I think it'll be interesting with time too, I think, People still want to see their doctor, see mm. their surgeon, even if it's only for a short time. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see. But if the option is not at all, which is true of many men, and yep. and also we we know, you know, through my work with the Australian Men's Health Forum and also Global Action on Men's Health, that during COVID, the men 
didn't have access to GPs and just put things off. So the spike in prostate cancer diagnosis was quite significant. And, and it's, the impact has only been probably recognised now. Yeah, we're very much seeing that firsthand in the centre. So we know through COVID from the pathology companies, uh, at its peak, about there was a 70% drop in PSA testing. And that's, to your point, men through COVID just weren't going to their GPs. And then, you know, when the system comes back to some normality, your life keeps going, you say, I'll do it tomorrow, do it tomorrow, or, yeah, tomorrow may never come. So um, we're certainly seeing now some men that I think would have probably been picked up earlier had they got to their GP Mm. um, through COVID. Um, And it'll be interesting to see what that data looks like over the next few years. Given that, you know, it's the leading cause of cancer in men here in Australia and the second in the world, and then I look at things like bowel screening, breast cancer screening, which, you know, you are getting letters in the mail left, right and centre. You've basically got a kit that comes and does it for you, especially with the bowel screening. Why isn't there something like that for prostate cancer? Yeah... Great question. <laughs> he's, 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 he's almost crying now. Yeah. Uh, look, if you go back, uh, I think what drove some of the, not hysteria, but the, the, the media narrative around this five years ago was there was a perceived view that if we went to mass screening for men for prostate cancer, that we would be over-treating men that didn't need it and surgeons would be making lots of money and the system would be, you know, very wealthy and we would be over treating men i think that was a fairly mute point for those that were in the sector uh that wasn't the case because the same could be said for the others yeah correct so where it sits at the moment is um we spoke before pcfa are currently working with the government on the new national screening guidelines um and they will probably come out somewhere over the next sort of 12 to 18 months That'll be interesting to see what they show in terms of, you know, do we mandate it or not? It's probably unlikely, I think, that they'll mandate it, but I think hopefully there'll be a lot more awareness. Why is it unlikely? Um, It'll probably come down to the statistics in terms of what the analysis shows and how you look at that and the social impact into it. So there's a whole sort of range of factors that will come into that, but... We'll see where it goes, but I think where we have got better is it is far more in the psyche uh, and the GPs, I think, are far more comfortable. And particularly, if you look at men now, a lot of the men we see that have got prostate cancer, we now do what's called active surveillance. So we know they've got it, but we know it's probably slower growing and therefore it's a sort of a sit, watch and wait. Um, so regular checking um, over a period of time. So we've got much better in the research and the, the, the medical space of identifying you know, really aggressive uh, prostate cancer and that that's more slow growing. Mm. So the more we get better at that, uh, the more that'll help also inform what guidelines should be, I think. Mm. We sort of jumped the gun a bit on to, in some of my questions, but I want to sort of go back while you're speaking about this to ask you, uh, working in this space, does that make you more rigorous about your own health? Uh, yeah, I think it does. Um, I shouldn't say think. But yeah, it does for me. Because it can have the opposite effect when you're so involved in the care of others that you can like, overlook yeah. your own. I think I already had. I would like to think a healthy awareness of sort of you know seeing your GP somewhat regularly, uh, and I do that. I think what my role has helped me with is my mental well-being. You know, um, coming into the, the sector and what we built um, with our team. You what know, brought you to the sector, by the way? Uh, it's a really good question. Uh, I knew somebody, uh, the CEO had left at the time, uh, then sort of met the people and was probably going to be there for three to six months and I'm still there after nine years. So That um, really doesn't answer the question at all. That just makes it sound like you were walking <laughs> past one day and you saw the old CEO walking out and you just went, oh. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I sort of knew somebody uh, associated with like, the Like, did you have an interest in it or? Yeah, I'd always sort of had an interest in the medical space. I'd been involved in radiology and a few other areas. So uh, for me, what attracted me to it was that mixture we spoke before. You've got this wonderful charity aspect to it and then some amazing 
individuals that wanted to do uh, well in the community with their expertise in that space. So mm. to me that seemed like an attractive um, uh, marriage of things. But on the sort of for my health, yeah, I think, you know, I'd, I'd openly say, it, I mean, Max and Brenda, our psychology team, I've lent on them a lot personally um, through through the role that I've had. Um, yeah. And that's been wonderful. And also observing the role they do with the, the men as well. So, you know, uh, Max has done quite a few mindfulness sessions with ourselves and the staff and some of our corporate partners. So I've learned, I think, the importance of, of you know, mental health in, in those spaces. So, mm. yeah. So for me, I, I'm far more aware. I wouldn't say I'm a perfect specimen, but I think... You, know, you look pretty good. You look very fit. Yeah, try to. Uh, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of swimming. <laughs> Since, you know, over the last 10 years, what is the greatest challenge that you didn't expect to have in this role? Long pause. Um, I think we always thought we could uh, find the appropriate funding to help more men. I, I think when we started, uh, you know, we knew we had a few speed bumps, but it's such a compelling, you know, to us, um, it's such a personal view, but it's such a compelling story that you kind of go, it makes sense for, you know, big philanthropy community and government to get behind. So we've always struggled to, to do that. Mm. And maybe maybe we're a victim of our own success to some degree in that space. Yeah, I, and I, then I think about it, you think about resources, space, time, funding, and it's a very fine line between getting too big where you can't service what your purpose is and then staying small where it's it's not reverberating as, as enough. Yeah, that's right. It's always a hard balance when you want to grow a business like that to stay true to your spirit. Yeah. Um, I think we're, we always say, uh, some of our original founders were always very much, and I remember when I walked in, they said, make sure you check your ego at the door. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that's sort of the nature of the people that we've got. I think everyone has a really good intent. They're experts in their area. Yeah. And they want to do good. So yeah, we tend not to let uh, hubris get in the way too much. I think that's very true of the men's health space in general, and that's women who participate as well. I, I'm one of those those women that the care factor is so high, and oftentimes, you know, people are you know working above and beyond um, expectation because again of the lack of resource and funding policy strategy that we'll talk about a bit later. That could so be, you know, we we could just be so much better at everything um, with those with with those things. So. Um, it, it, it's something. Yeah. And I think for all of us, um, you know, a lot of it's, you just spoke about there, when people get involved, it's personal why they're involved. I think, you know, everyone has their own reason, either they've been uh, impacted by it or feel a sense of belonging or purpose to it. So if you can create an environment where people can bring that to the table, it's amazing what you can achieve. Yeah. You know, at one of the White Owl events, I'm sure I've told you this story before, but it was a few, quite a few years ago, and we were there at Marvel Stadium. It could have been Etihad at the time. I don't, I don't even know what it is now. Uh, it's Marvel now. Yep. Is it? Anyway, I was speaking to to a gentleman who was attending the event, and he had a backpack on, and he said, um, "Do you know what's in my backpack?" And I went, "No." One could have panicked at that question, and he said, "It's my shame." And I went, wow, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, I recently um, recovered from prostate cancer, which is awesome. But what it's left me with is incontinence to a degree that I have to wear a male nappy at all times. So I'm at this event. My one nappy has been completely soiled. That's in my backpack. I've got another one on that's going to give me about another, what, 30 minutes and then I've got to go home because there is no disposal unit for male sanitary items anywhere in the world and I went whoa wow never thought about that you know I mean I knew about prostate cancer and had probably dabbled in thoughts around what are the other impacts of it but incontinence being one of them incontinence also that now there are great organizations like bins for blokes which have you know started rectifying that issue of no sanitary disposal units for men but what are the other impacts on men, Mark? Yeah, that, that, that's 
yeah, you wouldn't get a more uh, graphic story than the one you got shared that mm. night. Um, so continence, uh, sexual dysfunction, uh, are probably two of the bigger ones and the flow and effect they have in their socio-economic, uh, socio-relationships they have uh, for men uh, are probably two of the bigger ones. Uh, and then certainly as prostate cancer gets advanced, you know, men can get a lot of broken bones, etc., so they can have multiple impacts. But, yeah, the two biggest ones we talk about uh, and it depends on the man's journey. Many men don't suffer, but most men will have some form of incontinence um, for a short period after their uh, prostate being taken out, and then they'll recover that over time, so that's yep. great. Similar for sexual function, but some men, depending on where their disease has advanced, we may not be able to protect those um, or preserve those to the level they have today. Mm. That's where, uh, at our place, the physio, the psychology team... The nursing team, the specialists work really well to give the men strategies. And it's not just the men, it's their families, because to your point, that's what impacts their life. Now, some men can deal with that, some won't. So, you know, some men wear incontinence pads, uh, they feel a loss of um, pride, of dignity, or their sexual function. Um, so we do a lot of work, but they're two areas that can ultimately, you know, in its worst form, um, you know, lead to suicide, which is a horrible mm. thing to see men go through. Um, but it can also lead to breakdown in relationships uh, yeah. as well. So, um, again, not to paint the picture that every man goes through that, uh, which they don't. How many men have good outcomes, but for many men, they will experience some form of that. Yeah. And what I would say is uh, for any man that goes through that, um, you shouldn't have to suffer in the sense that whilst it may not be fully repairable, in some cases it can be, but there's ways that you can get great support and help. And I think that's yeah. where we realised with the psychology team, working with the men and their families together, mm. can make a huge difference. And especially because your psychology team is so focused on that specifically and some of those outcomes as well. And, you know, I, I personally see outcomes in my private practice of men who have, you know, survived prostate cancer, who have some of these outcomes where it's much easier to sit at home and take out a habit like drinking because that's... <laughs> that can dull some of the some of the pain you know and that leads to an impact on dopamine and serotonin which can feel like depression which as you said can be a precursor to suicide so you know i think if you know people or men in particular obviously that survive prostate cancer that's a great thing but also be very very aware that there might be other things going on as well that need support understanding um and recognition yeah, it's a great point we often talk our psychology team talk a lot about that of um you know <laughs> we get very focused on the prostate cancer and the impacts it has but people are in their life uh and you know whether that's whatever's going on in their normal life let alone how they're trying to deal with the trajectory they've got on their prostate cancer so yeah, yeah it makes for a very interesting oh, and masculinity folks is a beautiful thing we like to precursor that with toxic but it's actually not it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing that involves a whole kaleidoscope of stuff like dignity and pride that you mentioned and you know not addressing those things can have a have a really terrible effect and yeah. we often talk at um, our center there are a lot of men not all a lot of the men won't uh, go and see our psychology team but we kind of find ways to, to, to get them there <laughs> um but it's amazing once they go there um you know it's they want to go there all the time which is a mm. great sign for us that uh what the service is doing but as our psychology team often say, they're not doing anything other than really having a conversation with them and they're giving us some strategies to deal with where they're at. So it's sort of destigmatizing that whole piece to your yeah. uh, earlier piece on mental health, you know, mm. how do men get to feel comfortable to say, you know, when they catch up with their mates, well, I did go and see my psychologist and, you know, they're very open yeah. about it if they want to be. So. Well, I think that has a lot to do with, the, you know, the stereotype the boys are raised in that they, they don't speak. You know, boys just aren't good at talking or men aren't good at seeking help, which is crap. Mm -hmm. It's how they're shown. So as soon as they enter into a space where, you know, they are in, in an environment of support and care... They bloody love it because guess what? They're human. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So, so you know, raising boys, people think about it. Um, now, in terms of APC research, what kind of breakthroughs have been made over the years that are notable? Yes, we really started um, collecting um, 
when the prostate was taken out, we started collecting the tissue, uh, blood samples, and then following those men over many years. And we've done that uh, over the last probably 10 or 12 years. Our focus was to understand the genetic driver between lethal prostate cancer and more benign form of it in terms of the slow growing. So we've been able to identify a couple of genetic genetic signatures uh, in that space, which is a great start because that also helps to new future therapies and or new diagnostic tests. So that's been a, probably one of our real big pieces that we've focused on. Um, outside that... Um, that alone is just... <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty amazing stuff. There's awesome. an amazing team that's been involved yeah. in it. And that's been, you know, some of that tissue we've collected has been used globally to help inform our best practice. So ultimately that will lead to what's the best form and combination of therapy for the individual at the right time on their trajectory mm. or, you know, another way of saying personalised medicine. <laughs> personalised um, medicine. And then there's a couple other things, you know, if I think of some current ones, um, in the next couple of weeks we'll probably implant the first um, device in a man in the world to be done um, for helping him with getting sexual function back with erections. Um, Wow. Yeah, so that's uh, kind of exciting. So when the nerves can't be preserved in the operation, uh, a man will lose his sexual function um, in terms of being able to get an erection. So it's come from pacemaker technology. So uh, we're looking to implant that probably uh, somewhere in the next month uh, which will be the first in the world. Uh, that, that shows great promise to help those men in the future as well. Wow, that's, yeah, again, that's yeah. just a- absolutely outstanding. Yeah. Um, will that be newsworthy? Yes, yeah, I think that one will be newsworthy um, <laughs> for many reasons. Um, but yeah. yeah, definitely. And then the one we just opened up uh, with a partner who, who brought it to our centre, uh, MTIC, um, it's the Melbourne Theranosic Innovation Centre. Mm. This is a, an amazing form of new therapies that have come through in terms of delivering a, effectively a radiation dose that only goes to the cancers via your blood. Mm. Um, and that looks like it'll have a huge benefit to men um, with very uh, late stage aggressive prostate cancer. Mm. So, um, so, yeah, some exciting things coming through. Well, there's so much being learned on this show. Uh, today, Mark, thank you for, for all the sharing. Um, now we're up to our next very special guest song request. Mm-hmm. And the corresponding cryptic clue, he goes, and this is the easiest one I think I've <laughs> yeah, ever offered somebody. So <laughs> your heart rate doesn't need to go up. Something you might do when you're asleep. Gee, you're going to embarrass me because I've forgotten which one I gave you. Think of... Um, Fleetwood oh, Mac. of course, yes. Yeah, dreams. <laughs> dreams, that's yeah. the one. That's I, hit, the I hear one. it regularly when I walk past the gym. <laughs> <laughs> Great song. I, I love this song yeah, list. Yeah. Uh, but when we come back, we're going to delicately explore funding strategy and policy issues that impact poor outcomes around prostate cancer. Um, also more about the terrible outcomes resultant from not addressing it as a serious issue as, say, breast cancer that incidentally also affects men does Mm. so there you go uh you're listening to 94.1 fm it's 3wbc do not go away welcome back you're listening to 94.1 fm it's 3wbc i'm ray bonney joined by mark harrison he dedicates days and possibly many nights dreaming of ways to support men and families experiencing prostate cancer like how i Linked that back to the song. Did very well. (laughs) The master of it. Um, Now, we mentioned breast cancer before we went to the break, and not that I intend this to be a gender comparison, but it kind of is. Um, But it's more about sort of funding inequity and, and, and why. You know, prostate cancer is now the most common cancer diagnosed in Australian men, overtaking breast cancer as the country's leading cause. Um. So just why? We were kind of talking about this in the break. I think there's there's a couple of things. We do a lot of work with the breast cancer networks and I think they are uh, more mature and aligned in how they approach governments, the community. So uh, prostate cancer probably hasn't had as many organisations in that space as 
sort of breast cancer has become more mature in terms of how they approach those things? Well, if you tweak it to the, you know, the non-gendered stuff like suicide, which, you know, men populate most of that, is a really, really big thing. And, you know, back in October last year, Australia published its first national women's budget in 18 months. That's the third in 18 months. Uh, And with the new Labor government committing more than $10 to improving the lives of and health of um, women and girls, and there was nothing for men. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's one of those ones that's complex, right? There's the whole perception of males and generally, traditionally, we haven't wanted to talk about our health or be involved in things. Why? Why? Traditionally. Traditionally, I, I don't know. Um, you might take a view that some people would say, you know, we'd prefer to look after our partner before we look after our own health. What about traditionally women were in charge of raising kids and raising boys? Yeah. So maybe that has something to do with it. Yeah. and I think, Dare I say. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's a melting pot of all those things combined, but I do agree with you there. But men aren't biologically disposed to not predisposed to not seeking help and caring about themselves, are they? I don't believe they are. I think traditionally, I shouldn't keep using that word, but I think we've been poorer at it, but we're getting better at it. But isn't that how boys are raised, not the biological predisposition? Uh, Yeah, and the more, to your point, the more I think we can educate the boys coming through today about their health, the importance of health, how to go about it, I think that then has a flow and effect to people getting more actively involved and engaged in promoting the causes and bringing a light to it. Well, that's why I mean, you mentioned Neil Danaher before in the ice bucket and, yeah. you know, how he's done such amazing work. And then before you also talked about the, you know, the 50 plus demogra- demographic of men who are really excited about their health and participating. So there's your proof points to say yes. It is not a biological thing. It does happen. Permission needs to be granted to do it, though, doesn't it? That's right. And I think on top of that, then you've got to have governments, both you know, local, state, federal, you know, realising that there's much impact we can have to extend those men's life uh, in many ways. And, you know, you've seen many forms of the men's health strategies try to get up, I think. There are areas that still need to be explored further and crystallised into well, what they are. It doesn't are. have any funding attached to it. So there's some great ideas that are now sort of become redundant over, when was it, 2018? I think the last one was created, which still hasn't been brought to life. So it's just sort of sitting in the too hard basket somewhere. Yeah, and sadly, you know, you mentioned Neil Danaher, I think, you know, the harsh reality sometimes of these things is you need very sad and tragic cases like like Anil, unfortunately, you know, in, in a prostate cancer space to bring a, a public light back to it for people to ask questions and start challenging, mm. well, why are we not providing enough uh, funding into research and support in those yeah. spaces? Yeah. I think it also has to have, you know, um, appeal across, you know, all diversity. It can't, you know, anything that specifically men tends to just be put, in a let's forget about that and focus on something more appealing um, when when it's not, you know, if it's about women, you know, and again, like you said before, you know, the, the stuff that's done for women is amazing and so deserved and so needed, not at all questioning any of that. It's just, but what about men too? Yeah, and I, I live in hope. Glass is always half full. I, I hope the learnings we've seen the great advances we've done in that area and I know there's still a long way to go but if we can take any of those learnings to where we go with men's health in the next period then we'd be silly not to look at what's worked and what hasn't worked. Yeah well I was talking to you in the break about I was listening to a great interview um, with Russell Brand yesterday that man I was thinking if I had any wish in the world I probably would inhale the vocabulary he has and how he uses it just an absolute master of it. But he was talking about fatherlessness and that comes onto my radar a lot when working with men and commonly that's occurred through parental alienation, you know, in in relationship breakdown. But prostate cancer is also a contributor to fatherlessness which impacts children. Yeah, that's right. And I think uh, we've got 
you know, if I think of that raw prostate cancer we spoke at the start around protecting your legends, you know, that's a bit we want people to see their their dads, their uncles, their grandfathers live longer. So if they can get tested earlier, we know men have great outcomes now. Um, and I know we were talking through the break, I think part the... Public. We did a lot of talking know, in the break, yeah, didn't we? Correct. Thank God yeah. you've chosen long yeah. songs. But I think, <laughs> I think part of that public challenge at the moment is we are doing so well with men um, in terms of getting the disease early. They're living a good, um, you know, good quality of life. Uh, their sexual function is back. Their continence is back. Life feels normal, and they're fantastic stories. But you know, amongst that, there's still you know three and a half thousand men, sadly, that are losing their life to very aggressive prostate cancer, mm. and they're the ones that sometimes get pushed back into the public psyche. Does it hurt? Me? No prostate cancer. Like, does oh, it? Where does it? Yeah, hurt? it does. Yeah. So it, it. The sad part is, it's a silent disease uh, until you really start to see it progress. But if you see a man that might have a crushed fracture in his spine and he's now you know, wheelchair bound because he's had deposits in there and then the bone has collapsed and other deposits around in his body, that hurts. That's wow. that's very sad. Um, you know, men going through forms of chemotherapy uh, are very challenging. Um, so, yeah, I, I think any of the men we see, I, I can't speak for them, but I think they would say there's a lot of pain. Mm. What is the story that's most touched you during your time? Uh, if you can say. If it's, you good, can. it's good I can't cry, isn't it, on, on radio? You will cry. I will. No, no. <laughs> um, the one that touches me most, uh, it's a pretty simple one, I think. Um, and there's been many, I should say. Um, probably the one that really sticks in my mind was uh, about six years ago, um, I heard coming down the corridor a, a whole lot of laughing and we sort of stuck our head out the door and there was this family high-fiving the team as they were going out. Um, the patient had just been through a big range of uh, surgery, radiotherapy. Anyway, they got the all clear and life was looking very good, so they were thrilled. Um, the week after, and it was about a month before Christmas, um, somebody grabbed me and said, oh, there's somebody at the front desk, I'd like to see you. So... I went and saw them, and um, they had their coal shopping bag, and in it um, they said, we're not buying uh, Christmas presents this year for the kids. Uh, we're going to give you the money we would have bought for the Christmas presents to donate to the centre for you to use. Um, it was circa sort of $250,000, oh, sorry, $250. Mm. Uh, and that was probably the most oh, touching yeah. moment I had because... That was everything to them, um, but they felt in their way they were giving something back to us yeah. that we'd helped them with. So, yeah, that, there's been quite a few like that along the way, but uh, that's one that sticks in the mind. Yeah, that whole piece around gratitude and yeah. like real gratitude. Yeah. You know, we, we can say thank you and use the words, but the gestures uh, yep. and how that impacts the recipient, i.e. you or APC, to continue telling that story yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and the thing that amazes me on top of that is uh, the philanthropy and support we get from people. And that's not always about getting money. It might be somebody has an expertise in plumbing or somebody has an expertise yeah. in marketing or finance or legal. And they donate their time uh, willingly to help us because they know that we can't afford those things. Mm. So their stories, I think, uh, are always wonderful to acknowledge that uh, mm. we're a benefactor of those. Yeah, I think, you know, Australia is probably, well, I know is the most charitable country yeah. in the world. And it doesn't take much, as you said, it doesn't have to be money. It can just be time or something you don't need anymore that, that changes a person's life. And I know I've been very lucky in my own um, career in men's health because, again, there's not a lot of money attached yeah. to it. Uh, that people have helped me with certain things, you know, technology or anything it is, you know, getting messaging out, even being on the team here at 3WBC for the last eight years to have a voice in the community that also, you know, broadcasts across to all countries of the world is is such a privilege to be able to do that. Yeah. And I think we take gratitude in the in the small and quiet moments quite often too. It's the the non-public or the non-glaring moments mm. that are sometimes the most impactful. That's right. But then we look at the other side of it and, you know, this space is not competitive. Health should not be competitive. And 
it should not have to be, um, you know, something is more important than the other. I think we should try to really appreciate and understand and learn and educate ourselves on what we can do rather than just not what we can't. Yep. I think uh, the old Australian tall poppy syndrome, thankfully and hopefully, is uh, not as prevalent as it used to be. Mm. Yeah, in fact, my work on global action on men's health, I re- recently joined the board uh, well, early this year and it came to Men's Health Week um, in June and we were collaborating, we're, we're doing a piece of work with Movember uh, in the UK, which is a bit of research work, which is really, really exciting. And it came to Men's Health Week and Movember looking to uh, be a much greater participant in that space and you know there were a few people within the sector that sort of said no no you know this is our se- this is our sector Movember you do the the awareness raising the fundraising you do that bit but don't get involved in the actual piece and um, I thought well no it's you know anyone should be able to participate if it's raising awareness or you know raising funds or even um, actioning causing you know bringing a call to action I think anyone should be involved. Yeah, I agree. I think the more inclusive we are and uh, drop those barriers, the you know the bigger impact we're going to have. Mm. Um, but sometimes, yeah, people can sort of um, get a bit precious about their space. That's right. You know, my my guidance to people: if it, if it feels like it's about you, it shouldn't be. Yep. Yeah, that's a pretty good point. I think for us, we're always brought to ground too. Um, if you see some of that, you can walk back and see the patients and. I don't think they care about people, you know, looking after their feetums. They're only concerned about the best outcome you can give them. So mm. that's always a good reality check. Well, yes. Somebody um, messaged me yesterday about a charity event that they want to do again this year and they did one last year and they raised money for Beyond Blue. And I said at the time, that's all That's all well and good. However, again, it's just money and they were very focused on how much and they had a tally going all night and a yep. thermometer and yep. said, but what are you actually doing? Yeah. What are you actually doing? So they came to me this year and they said, well, we would like a bit of guidance around what more we can do because we still want to raise money. And I said, think about doing something. You know, posit- you know this, is, this is a mental health suicide prevention um, event. Think about maybe just sponsoring one person in the community who has a mental health challenge yeah. and paying for their treatment or their medication or whatever it might be and they said but what will that do for us and I went think about it yeah think about what you just said we often talk at um, our public fundraising events that if nothing else uh, through what we've done if one man goes and gets tested early and you know god forbid we pick up he's got prostate cancer but he will have a great outcome then that's been a success uh, no matter what happens on the night in terms of how much money you raise or whatever but if one male goes and gets tested early and you know we can help him uh be here for a lot longer then that's a, a big plus yeah ab- absolutely um and on that on on the fundraising we're going to talk more about what rule yep. is up to one of my clients in Derrimut, uh, actually, across the road, there's a they, they have trucks. Yep. Can't tell you who they are because I can't remember. But yeah. they have rural trucks. That's uh, Concept Logistics. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. 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 yeah they've uh, a wonderful supporter. Uh, they're a national freight company, so you can see trains going across the Nullarbor with yeah. rural prostate cancer on them, and their double bogey trucks going up and down freeways um yeah. so in terms of helping us sort of get that word out yeah uh, they've got a lot of branding on all of their trucks yeah, yeah. well in, in a conversation i had just about that somebody asked to me about their prostate cancer bus that they had seen turn up to site yep. um you originally uh collaborated with incolink yeah that's right yeah we've um <laughs> become bus experts we've had <laughs> <laughs> we've had two buses uh, uh one uh, was a first bus we took around a lot of the field days in the country that was purely just on uh, raising awareness around testing etc to male dominated work sites correct yep and then we together with Incolink uh, and the unions of Victoria built um, a purpose-built uh, you know, million dollar touring bus we retrofitted it with two GP rooms like you would see if you walked into a clinic and a weight and room. for those who don't know who Incolink is they're kind of the Victorian mates in construction 
Yeah, so sort of thing. Yeah, the they're a redundancy fund for all the builders, um, so that if a builder goes under, the workers' entitlements are preserved. But part of that is they provide, to your point, extensive wellbeing services. So huge program around um, blue hats and suicide prevention amongst yep. construction. So yeah, mm. they do a wonderful job. Sorry, I interrupted your flow there. No, no, but no that fits. Um, so that bus we built about five years ago. And you built the bus. Yeah, we built the bus. That was a good experience. Again, well, you didn't get a bus and then retrofit it. Uh, we, uh, we bought the bus and then we got a whole lot of people together. To show I just, had, I just, I just had this vision of you out in the you know car park, sort of literally building an entire bus. There, there was some truth to that. Um, we, the day we launched it in Geelong, it had to be at the new Victoria Police Headquarters in yeah. Spencer Street, and we were all up till two in the morning um, with workers. <laughs> they were doing the gluing and whatever, and we were trying to clean it. Um, but that bus, yeah, we, what we learned through a lot of our research is uh, males won't come to us, to a centre. So if we take the service to them, they'll, they'll, they'll use it in their environment. So the bus lands on, you know, the metro tunnel, the big vertical buildings. Uh, we have two GPs and a nurse in there. And the men literally, and we do look after women as well, but the men come down off the building site, have their appointment. How do you uh, look after women? Uh, so on that service, we didn't want to discriminate because we had GPs there. So we opened it up that any of the female workers that were on the site Great. could come down and see it. So we saw about probably 10% of the original um, cohort that we saw. Um, so those men would come down, see the GP, uh, have the discussion around testing, and I should also say their broader health. Um, and then they'd go back. Uh, and we've been doing that now probably about five years. It did get re-pivoted, like everybody, into COVID. So we were doing COVID testing, COVID jabbing um, throughout that, and now we're looking to get it back into that piece. Okay. So, but for us, it's been a hugely successful program um, in the sense that, yeah, take the service to them and they will use it, mm -hmm. and that was the biggest learning that we got from it. So organisations who might, you know, want the bus to come to them, do you have to be a certain kind of business and does it cost no, they don't have to be a certain part of the business. I mean, if they're part of... Um, or a certain kind of business, like could you be a manufacturing business? Or Yeah, correct. You could just approach us. Uh, we can take it out. Um, we work out how to do that. Um, so it's not purely and exclusively just for the building and construction sector. We mm -hmm. have used it a bit. And we also use it for a lot of promotion, again, around sort of you know rural field days or show days in the country yeah. because we know you know, that word gets um, more disseminated about the importance as you get further into rural yeah. areas. Is there a cost associated if a business were to ask for the bus to come along? Yeah, generally it is. We try to charge a co flat cost just to cover our cost for the day. Yeah. You know, we have to get a driver, staff, et cetera, and some consumables. Yeah. But it's fairly nominal in that sense. And, yeah, you can see, depending how you set the day up, we could see a couple of hundred people on that bus yeah. in a day. Yeah. And you have two buses? Now we crushed the other one. Yeah, so it's now about the size of your computer, which is your laptop computer. You crushed it, not crashed yeah. it. Yeah, no, no, we crushed it, yeah. Yep. Um, it was getting a bit old and tired, that one, and we wanted to do more um, delivery of services, which mm -hmm. is the previous bus couldn't do. So yeah. Yeah, so they got crushed. So how does one bus get across such a high demand? Um, yeah, we use it a lot, although I should say COVID really just threw us, like all of us, mm. threw us into a, yeah. a, a out of our, our, our sink. But we're now getting back into that space. Look, I think there was a view at some point um, you could have multiple buses. Yeah. I think somewhere in our mind that's still possible, but yeah. again, it, it is a costly exercise to mm. run a bus and take a medical service. But... Uh, yeah, I'm interested to see where that goes in the next couple of years. Yeah, I just think of all the compliance involved in something like that as we become more and more compliant uh, around health and safety. Yeah, that's right. I and mean, when you see it, well, there's literally cranes going on on the building site, mm. um, but the unions and Inkling do a great job of making sure it's you know parked in the right locations and a lot of safety around it. Mm. Well, uh, can you believe we are coming hurtling towards our final final break for the show how are you enjoying it being great, on air great except i'm not sure about the pressure on the song calling so I... <laughs> well we're whittling them down <laughs> yeah, you know, know the choices are getting I'm trying to remember what what's left <laughs> <laughs> well you know what the last one is um yes i do for those friends of the show know that i request songs no longer than three and a half minutes i don't know if anyone has ever um 
I feel honoured that. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many ones. It was like ten minutes. Like how how much of your talk time do you really want to eat into? The, the one thing I can say with your last song is there'll be a lot of men that'll be very happy to know that I got that song. It's a great. It's a them. great song. Yeah. The last song. Um, so, what we're going to do is have the cryptic clue, and this one really should be easy. She passed away last year, aged ninety six. You couldn't go past Queen Bohemian Rhapsody. That's correct. Well done. So you've only got one. Well, That's you right. could you couldn't answer one. Yeah. Uh, so when we return, we're going to be hearing all about the evolution of rural prostate cancer, its reason for being, and also the exciting uh, upcoming Legends Month. That's right. And how you can participate or buy things or, you know, help raise money. But most importantly, this show is, you know, like all of the shows, it's, you know, it's positioned to educate, to raise questions, to, you know, ignite curiosity in the particular guest and the topic that they're presenting. So this one is just, you know, by far one of the most important ones because prostate cancer, it is a male exclusive disease. But it affects everybody, absolutely everybody. So and so that's why everybody um, educating themselves and understanding will bring more of a call to action and less of this uh, awareness raising, blah, blah. So uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, Queen, it's a great one, isn't it? Great one. Uh, don't go away, folks. We will be right back. Oh, welcome back. The time is 33 minutes past 11 and you're listening to 94.1 FM. It's 3WBC with Ray Bonney and sitting opposite me is Mark Harrison. How would you describe yourself? Who are you? Uh, who am I? Uh, normal bloke enjoys simple things in life. Um, don't know what normal is, but uh, yeah, I just enjoy the simple things in life. Got a really close bunch of what I'd call mates. Um, and, yeah, trying to make every day a winner. Well, you were actually describing a simple moment in life just then uh, with your daughter. I was, yeah. She's uh, going to be 18 next or next month and we are trying to get her driving hours up. I know many people will have done that before. So we've got 30 hours and about three weeks to get, so we're going to be doing a lot of driving. But, yeah, we had a, one of those nice simple moments. We drove into Ligon Street, got a bowl of pasta and an ice cream and, yeah. They could be as good as anything you could find, you know, just having time talking about anything and everything. What made you appreciate that moment? Uh, probably because I knew it's about to end soon in the sense it'll be different because, yeah, soon she'll be driving and she won't mm. need, might need Dad to drive her anywhere. <laughs> she'll need you for other things, though. That's right. Yeah, correct. It just moves to a different phase. I find it really interesting, you know, culturally in Australia how we – you know, raise families or ha or have families that there seems to be this cut off point that people go, well, I've got to make the most of this time with my child because they'll be gone soon. And my response is, well, where are they going? Like, yeah, <laughs> where are they right. going? And it's like, well, you know, no, because you can continue this relationship. You know, all relationships are an evolution, and you know, it doesn't mean you're less close. It just means you're closer in in all different ways. Yeah, that's right. I always think uh, you kind of go through these phases of life and, uh, you know, it's just going to be a different phase. Like, we'll still have a wonderful relationship. We'll just, we'll do, hopefully still do that again, but she might drive and meet me there rather than us drive together there. So That's right, and pay as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that happens. <laughs> well, it does. It's interesting because I've mentioned to probably the world and beyond that I recently became a grandmother to... Evelyn Ann, and she was a month old yesterday, which is really exciting. But I was sort of, you know, observing the biological connection I have to her, but also how my own maternal instinct has sort of kicked up a few notches with Rose, my daughter, um, because it's my job to actually still protect Rose as, as my child so she can raise hers. And it's just a really amazing thing to watch. And she sent me a text message the other day and she just said, I love doing this with you. And I was like, yeah, because we're both mums now. How good is that? <laughs> yeah. So there's this this bond that we have now that is is deepened yeah. a, even further. Yeah. Uh, so 
Well, you've got all the wisdom that you can impart from things you've learned along the way uh, to her as well. <laughs> Which is interesting because we've both observed that um, I cut every corner that I can and she doesn't. <laughs> you know, that, that terrifies her, that the corners need to be there and they need to be sharp and crisp and visible. And so we probably have very differing approaches to, to, to anything. So we've got to celebrate the diversity. Yeah, but it's okay. Yeah, I would say two heads, two heads are better than one. Absolutely. It doesn't matter how you, how you get to the end no. point. Now, you've had a pretty busy week because I've been watching. You, you, you are so not a participant in social media. <laughs> so <laughs> when, on, the rare, people than me, yeah. <laughs> on the rare occasion I see your face on social media, it's like, oh, well, there's Mark. <laughs> uh, now, Rules are National Legends Month. Yes. Yeah, it was great. We launched it uh, at Mick Malloy's pub in Brunswick on uh, Thursday. Was he there? Uh, he was stuck in the snow, so yeah, Mick. Stuck in the snow doesn't sound so terrible. Yeah, he was trying to get back, but uh, he didn't get back in time. He got back later in the day, so mm. he's going to do some more work for us to help promote it, which is great. Fantastic. But uh, yeah, no, it was fantastic. We had um, some campaign ambassadors. We had uh, um, you know, Steve Hooker, the gold medalist, uh, Joe uh, Bailey, Silvani and the Silvani family, uh, Rosemary Blake and her family, Brian Nan Curvis, um, many others. Uh, so it was great, and you know the what we're trying to do through the National Legends Month, uh, which runs all of August up into Father's Day, is that bit we spoke about earlier about trying to bring a light to celebrate the legends in our lives, uh, and the best way to see that expression will be uh, Shrine Hoteliers Association member pubs um, will be in their in their um, uh, bistros and in the bars displaying a bucket hat or what we call a bucket, um, so people can buy a twenty dollar bucket. Uh, to support the cause, we're hoping to raise five hundred thousand dollars. When you say bucket, you mean the hat? Yeah, the yeah. hat. Yeah. yeah. So it's don't like, be confused, people. You're not buying a bucket. Correct. You're not buying a bucket. That's right. Yeah. So it's a bucket. It's the hat. style of. The it's hat. the style of the hat. Correct. Yeah. You've got to stay on stay on point. Oh Whether yes, I'm always answering days. their questions vicariously. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and what you'll be able to the money they raise in those pubs uh, will all come back uh, to. Uh, rural prostate cancer and 100% of that's going to the Australian Prostate Centre for more research, care and treatment of, of the patients we've spoken about. Um, so yeah, we're really excited. It'll be, we think, circa 500 pubs across the land. Okay. And what we what we see a lot of is some wonderful social media running from like the Currumburra pub, the Bendigo, the Wodonga, the Warrandyte and some of the city pubs. So they really get behind it. So we're lucky. So is there activity attached to the purchase of the hat? Like no, so some pubs do run uh, a few functions, um, so it's up to them what they run. Okay. Quite a few of them run you know, functions on, on the night, but throughout that whole month they'll be on display uh, and being promoted. Uh, and then we've got a couple other key events coming up uh, with Ross Stevenson running Love Letters to Football mm -hmm. uh, on August 31st. I've um, been a participant, been a participant that for the last so few years. Some wonderful yeah. rollicking stories about people's love yeah. of football. Yeah, Gil McLaughlin spoke yeah, last, last year. year and then... I really loved what he spoke about and then I heard his brother interviewed on The Imperfects, which is a quite a yeah. well-known podcast. Um, and that, oh gosh, if anyone wants, what's his name? Uh, uh, Hamish. Hamish. Yeah. Oh, just, yeah, anyone wants to have a listen to some miraculous story, Hamish McLaughlin on The Imperfects, great interview. Yeah, and I think he's got an amazing series coming up where he's interviewing a couple of the celebrities one-on-one uh, -on -one as well, oh, okay. uh, which I think is coming to free to wear in the next month. Wow. Um, yeah, so for us, National Legends Month, uh, and in addition to that toolkit depot, or TKD, um, uh, running a raffle uh, trying Who to raise they? money for us. So they're a subsidiary of Bunnings, um, so they're very heavy in the tool trade space. Uh, for like trade. are they a retail? Yeah, retail outlet. Yeah, they've got about uh, 25 stores across the country, getting much bigger. Right. Um, so they've been a wonderful partner and they're going to um, run a ute raffle for us where people mm -hmm. can buy a, uh, a ute yeah. um, with $10,000 worth of tools in the back of it. All right. Yeah, and people then, can buy a Ute, you said, but they can buy a ticket to win a Ute. Can't yeah, they? Great. that's correct. It should mm. be a buy a ticket to win a Ute. Yeah, because that would be a really it. bloody cheap. It would <laughs> correct with all the tools as well, <laughs> wouldn't we'd, it? We'd sell a few. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th that's the month of National Legends uh, Month, and then we run into Father's Day, uh, yep. where we'll finish up the campaign. Um, so yeah, for us, it's a great opportunity to you know talk about the legends in our lives, talk to that into forty-five year olds about getting them to talk to their their loved ones, um, and we'll have quite a few patient stories we'll be sharing throughout yeah. social media as well. 
what what is the main thing you hope to achieve without sounding you know like that's obvious right but no yeah it's easy to sort of say you know we're trying to raise five hundred thousand dollars i mean that's clearly going to make a huge impact because we can see more men with that money and do more research sounds like such a small amount of money compared to how much should be pledged through yeah i agree government yeah funding. i think we we feel we can probably amplify that over the years but Mm. um yeah that feels like if the campaign resonates with the community you know uh, everybody helping buy twenty dollars i did tag the australian government in all the social media for this show by the way (laughs) so thank you (laughs) if anyone comes your way (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we'll let you know. Um, but, yeah, look, I think that earlier piece we are talking about too, again, just bringing awareness to it of talking about people, about having positive conversations about prostate cancer. And, again, if you're in that window, making sure that you are going to talk to your GP or finding a way to get to a GP to get yeah. tested. For people that are listening in, you know, we have helplines for everything and I'm going to mention those in a moment. But for people that it might be experiencing thinking about worried about is there a national helpline for prostate cancer uh there's not a national helpline you can go to pcfa uh and come in through the nurse network that's a good starting point yeah um anyone's also welcome to call uh, us at the australian prostate center in north melbourne or, or go to the australian prostate center.org.au mm. um you can definitely reach out to us are PCFA. they 24 hour lines no they're not 24 so i think we'd be sending people through uh lifeline beyond blue okay in those that are yeah. well known um but if anybody is struggling or needs any other help uh, that's not urgent in that space yeah then i'd encourage them to go to pcfa.org.au yeah. or australian prostate center yeah and you know there that's you know you've got research documents information Correct. there's a lot of research information in there um there's a lot of uh points to direct people where to find further information yeah um so that's probably the best starting point yeah yeah so you know we've mentioned you know you guys pcfa yep. movember also yep. has a lot of information on their website just even some of those f um faqs yep that's right frequently asked questions, questions. Yep. can somewhat just dull down some of the distress you might be feeling in the unknown too yeah definitely and um, what we do know quite often in these spaces is you know information is uh, power so if yep. people can get that information uh, there's also some great resources published by pcfa for people living with prostate cancer yep. they can request copies of those they're also mm. available online yeah um so yeah i think the old story in today's world wide web, there's a lot of information out there, but um, if you go to those more authoritative places yep. like Movember, PCFA, Australian Prostate Centre, yeah. um, I think you're in good hands. And if you want to jump online to Rule, that's R-U-L-E, capital letters, prostate cancer, you can purchase... Um, you can purchase a bucket hat directly off yep. us uh, or donate directly through that way. Uh, you'll also find some information about how we uh, became about and you can also uh, link yeah. on to the Australian Prostate Centre website. And because you're a registered charity, it's all tax deductible? All tax deductible, yep. So uh, tax deductible, uh, registered charity, um, and people, as we were talking about earlier, can see in real first hand where the yeah. funds are going to. Yeah. And if you're thinking of having an event, I know we've mentioned the rural events you know, associated with yep. the uh, Hoteliers yep. um, Association. Association, yeah, Australian Hotel. You can do it in yourself. You know, if you want to have an event yourself at right. your home, at your workplace or anything like that, you can you can just get the stuff and, and do it yourself. Yeah, correct. Uh, if people uh, are running their own uh, charity event, like you've mm. mentioned, um, we can help them provide some resources and support yeah. to, to uh, that event. Um, but there's nothing stopping people, and particularly nowadays with, you know, GoFundMe pages and the like. Yeah. It has become a whole lot easier, I think, for yeah. people to uh, create an event. Yeah, uh, we certainly see more of those happening, which is fantastic. Um, people will just get together at mm. either you know local hall or mm. a pub or. A, but or workplaces place. are a great place, and I'm not sure if it was you I was speaking to uh, last week or Laurie Serafini, who's also going to come on the show, about why aren't workplaces picking up men's health uh, topics more in terms of you know workplaces are having lots and lots of different events, you know whether it's you know daffodil week or whatever it might be so why aren't we having more men's health events and i think from all the reasons we discussed today we we know why that is however prostate cancer i guess is one of those ones that literally does affect everybody and is probably one of those more palatable men's health issues so 
in your workplace, if you're wondering about an event, especially around that Father's Day time, or if it's International uh, Men's Day or it's Men's Health Week, it's a really, really good one because it, 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 it does make a difference. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. And if people talk more about it in their workplace, again, helping destigmatize the conversation, all those things, yeah. uh, only good can come out of that. Yep. Um, and we're seeing, you know, I think, again, you know, things are settling down post-COVID, but it seems like more corporates are now being able to spend time focusing back in those areas, uh, yep. which is a pleasing sign to see. Especially when it comes to health and wellbeing policy or health and wellbeing uh, initiatives within the workplace, it should be one of them. Uh, you, we see, uh, you know, uh, donating blood, for example. You have teams of people, they all go together and then have lunch afterwards, whatever. Yeah. Same thing could be done. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I think, sadly, in many ways, there's so many worthy causes now. Mm. Um, and where I'd like to think one of them, but, you know, that we are equally as important as whether it be pancreatic cancer, bowel cancer, breast cancer, you know. So... I think quite often what happens is it might be the individuals in those organisations that may have been impacted or those workers and they tend to then gravitate to those that's more uh, relatable to, yeah. to the workforce. Yeah. yeah. When I was doing the uh, research for this show, yeah. I, I did some Googling. I love the Googling that doesn't turn up anything and it was, was something around prostate cancer and uh, leading cancer, something rather but it, it took two pages, I think, to actually get to anything that mentioned prostate cancer. It was all very generic. Um, yeah. and, and breast cancer featured quite yeah. high as well. It was interesting. Um, a couple of our surgeons uh, last month uh, tested out chat GPT. They put in a diagnosis <laughs> into it to see what it came back with, and they said it wasn't too bad. Oh, good. Not, not 100% there yet, but it was, uh, yeah. Oh. They were more impressed than under-impressed, I think. I'm going to have to do a show on this chat um, chat. What is Chat it GPT. G yeah. GPT. A lot of I love writing. Mm. I love writing. I love researching. So I have no need for it yeah. really. Um, but a few of my friends use it, and you know, it's 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 come a bit a cropper in places like law, and 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 you know where it's not really sticking quite well. But um, but I am going to take you up and Travis Strong on reversing the yeah, tables we here. That'd be, that'd be fun. I think it's a really really yeah. good idea. I reckon we could almost do like that. Th this is your life. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to go across a few shows as well. <laughs> now, if any of our discussions today have brought tears to your eyes, no, really, brought up uncomfortable feelings for listeners, please remember help is there. Uh, a few options that Mark suggested before uh, is Lifeline. The number there is 131114. Suicide Callback Service, 1300 659 four six seven and emergency services is triple zero it's there for a reason it's not triple nine if you watch too much american television it can <laughs> we can mistake that now i'm going to be back on sunday the 17th of september uh august i've got something else on but um hopefully i'm going to be joined by one of australia's most recognized actors vince colosimo uh, we caught up last week at the 38 Reasons Why uh, Gala Ball, which was organised by Melbourne social connector and entrepreneur Steve McMiniman. That's I don't think that's even how you say it, but he recently lost his brother to suicide, his brother Sean. Uh, now, Vince has his own experience of mental health challenge and has most generously agreed to grace the studios of 3WBC, probably not comparable to some of the sets that he's been on before, but testament to the good man that he is, uh, contrary to what you might read in the media, because the media, remember, is the media. So, um, speaking of highly engaging programming... Here she comes, Paula Hogg, striding into the studios of 3WBC, looking beautiful as ever. She's all poised to roll out her entire lazy Sunday afternoon of music and banter, bound to get you relaxed. Now, I think she, we're, we're in Studio One at the moment, and because there's no visual on this, uh, it is the fancy studio. Um But um, I'm in here, and so I think Paula might be um, not wanting to go into Studio Two anyway. We have one final special guest song request, Mark. And this one won't be difficult. And I've saved not the best to last, but the longest 
to last. And that is, in fact, the clue. Aqualung. Mm. Jethro Tull. Jethro Tull. We're very high on the uh, playlist in the gym. Yes. And very grateful. There'll be many grateful that you uh, broke your rule and played along with a four-minute song. So thank you. Well, I thank you as well because I had not heard that song for such a long time, so much so that I thought, oh, I don't really know what this song is. And when I played it, I went, oh, you know when you're whatever it is in your brain, I should know this, being a psychologist, how it, you know, but basically thaws out parts of your brain that you've had in the freezer for Mm. such a long time going, oh, I remember that bit. I remember (laughs) that piece I had in my memory banks. So um, it it is a goodie though, isn't it? It is. It's a ripper. Um, They really like it. And thank you so much for uh, uh, the opportunity to have a chat with you and your listeners. It's been a lot of fun. Well, thank you, because uh, it's so generous. People are so lovely. Sunday morning is not always everyone's ideal time to, to come in, but you've provided such potentially life-saving insight into the reality of prostate cancer today. So thank you for doing that. And, and it's been so enjoyable for me. You're a really lovely, generous, humble guest, but so easy to converse with. Yeah, thank you. I'm um, looking forward to the interviewing you with Trevor. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Do you have a final uh, word for our audience today, Mark? Uh, no, my uh, hope is that we've shared an insight into where we are with prostate cancer, which has got a lot of positives about it, um, despite knowing that many are still suffering with it. But I think we the future looks bright um, and, yeah, we're excited about where we can go in the future. Yeah, well, good luck with all of it. And, you know, thank you and your team for years and years, days and days. And I know some of your days turn into nights as well. Uh of dedication to not only the cause but for the the outcomes for so many men and their families uh, who unfortunately have uh, have had this this uh, terrible diagnosis. No problem. Thank you. So here it is, people. This is um, Jethro Tull with a good six minutes and fifty six seconds, to be exact, <laughs> of Aqualung. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone, and do take care. And remember, it really is okay to not be okay.